Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm your host for today's webinar. We appreciate everyone attending. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before I introduce our uh, presenter for today's topic, which is enhancing multi uh, medium voltage transformer arc safety. Uh, there, anyone uh, registering and attending the session today will receive a certificate of attendance which uh, many use for extended education uh, credits. And uh, I would like to remind everyone that we uh, will be having an answer Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And so pl please utilize the question box from the control uh, controls on the webinar itself. And in addition to uh, the video when we post it on the website, there will be a PDF copy of the presentation material. So lot of ability to follow up even if you missed all the presentation. And as we are in the habit of doing, we like to start each uh, webinar with a set of poll questions. And today is no different. So our first poll question is transformer secondaries have notoriously high incident energy. It's a true or false question. There's no obligation. But we would appreciate your opinion and your feedback and weighing in on this particular question. It's one of those things where it could be tricky or it could be obvious. It's kind of up to you. So it looks like we have a quorum on this um, question. Thank you for responding. Here's how folks have weighed in. Looks like it's kind of a true is a heavy favorite on that one. All the, the answer to all these questions will be in our presentation, so don't go away. Uh, then the next question is typical overcurrent protection schemes. Transformer using a protection relay would be coded as what? And so here are choices. And again, there's uh, no downside for being for guessing. Part of it's kind of extending your your knowledge space and hopefully expanding the areas that you can improve based upon the material we'll be presenting. We do appreciate your attendance today. Hopefully you'll be getting needed education from the information we present. Okay, looks like we have a quorum on this one. Here's where the responses came in. Looks like 5051 was a heavy favorite there. And then finally, on a 2500 kVA medium voltage transformer, Primary fusing alone is enough to protect the operator working on a downstream system. Question, yes or no? And so I think we kind of gave it away <laughs> with our other two questions. So appreciate you participating. And uh, here's how folks weighed in on this one. Pretty heavily weighted towards the false side. And at this time, I'd like to uh, pass the baton over to our guest speaker, Mr. Sam Reed, who is a principal engineer at Eaton Industries and is involved in new product development. Give me a second to pass the baton. Okay, Sam, you have the podium. Perfect. All righty, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, just uh, to give you a little bit of background on myself, I won't go through my long-winded bio here, but uh, I might have a background in mechanical engineering and physics. Uh, I did some Postgrad work with SpaceX in uh, vortex magnetic systems, uh, specifically with their uh, their Hyperloop project. If uh, any of you are familiar with that, and then I moved into uh, Eaton and was formerly the lead application engineer for the transformer team uh, prior to moving into being the principal engineer for the new product development division uh, within within Eaton's transformer product line. Uh, so just to give you a, a brief overview of what we're going to cover today, um, obviously, you know, the, as the title suggests, we want to look at specifically uh, the enhancements of you, you can apply to specifically transformers and how to mitigate some of that low voltage arc flash instant energy. How do we solve that problem? Uh, but before I get into uh, the AR VFI transformer, I wanted to just talk of some, some really high level concepts, uh, something I call smaller, safer, superior. Are really how do we understand you know how we can use all different types of technology and componentry in order to create not only multi-functioning pieces of equipment but safer pieces of equipment and ultimately you know more optimized designs 
Um, and one of those effects on of that compact equipment I was just referring to on the total system design as it pertains to MV and, and LV for that matter. Um, and then some examples of that, and then we'll go right into uh, the arc reduction VFI transformer. And I have uh, a few case studies to share, uh, as well as some real world arc flash events uh, that we can show how this technology does actually play out uh, in the real world. So just getting, uh, just kind of going again in this high level, um, you know, when we're looking at technological development, whether it's the MV distribution world, low voltage distribution, even things as small as, you know, printed circuit boards, cell phones, that type of thing, we see this trend of obviously the, the initial kind of breadboard um, aspect of developing that technology, you know, refining that into something that is a, a little bit more robust and, and perhaps, you know, more integrated in its, its features, better laid out, more optimized. And then the final step being how we take that into a you know a scalable uh, but personalized scenario. And, and I'll I'll hit on a few heat key high notes here that essentially highlight what we're looking for when we create these very custom products, but they're still very um, very standardized. And how we can work to standardize our protection capability and then the integrated controls that we can put in some of this equipment. Obviously, in in the MV distribution world, everything is is very much engineered to order, very custom. Uh, but how can we leverage some of the standard design practice and, and some of these reoccurring features that we see in many different uh, protection systems and, and distribution systems? How can we really leverage that to create something that is, I'll call it um, custom but standard? You know, so how can we uh, take both of those those avenues? So as we see, you know, basic technology. I'll, I'll use the cell phone as an example. All of us have these in our pockets nowadays. Um, you can imagine, you know, we, we used to have a, a very large cell phone that was just a phone. And as time went on, um, you shrink that piece of technology, but it's also becoming more capable. And now we've got things, obviously, everyone has a, a touchscreen phone in their pocket. You know, you've got cameras on your phones. You have all sorts of different applications. It really enhanced by a long shot the, the functionality well beyond just that of a phone. Um, and at the same time, was able to really standardize on you know, in the industry on things like the chips or the camera lenses or the componentry that goes into that. So the, the idea here and what I really want to hit home is that there is a way to become multifunctional, to become integrated, to have all of this different functionality in, in one piece of equipment, but still have and drive that standardization and that, that practice so we can create reliable and robust products that, that do still have that custom nature. So that, that's great as it applies to cell phones, but uh, why we're here, we're talking about MV distribution um, specifically and, and, and LV in, in some regard, um, and that, how that pertains to you know, our jobs in, in the distribution world, and how can we take that same concept of you know, the smaller, uh, more compact, more integrated, and leverage that with our, our new technology, or these upgraded uh, multifunctioning pieces of equipment. Uh, and one thing that I think we can all agree on here, um, you know, it's it's very difficult to define what is a good piece of technology or what's the right methodology to to execute. You know, protection is a is a very complex way. There's a lot of ways to skin that one and and make sure that you know you're doing it correctly. You're doing it in the most efficient way. Uh, but I think what we can agree on is when something doesn't work or something's incompatible, um, it becomes very obvious to us. You know, you might have a protection setting that um, it's overly complex. There, you, you were really trying to do a lot of redundant componentry, and it ended up being too complex to to really be practical, or in some cases, just be scalable or, or repeatable. You know, it might have been a one-off scenario where uh, that did work for this instance. But how can we how can we really get that kind of cut and paste mentality while still having all of the necessary protection features and componentry that we're looking for? So, you know, one thing that I've kind of come up with is, is how do we characterize this, this quote unquote good technology? How do we make sure that when we are creating you know, standard multifunctioning pieces of equipment um, and we're trying to understand all the facets that go into that, not only the design and, and the physical manufacturing of that, but also the, you know, the compatibility with your current system, the, the usability of that. Um, I've got noted on here as well, the intuitiveness of that product. So. Um, all of these features and, and aspects of this come into play when we're trying to kind of create um, this custom but standard package, something that can be utilized on a variety of systems. It can be tailored to fit your need. However, it's repeatable. And with that repeatability, we get our reliability out of that. So, of course, the number one function, um, whatever that application is for that piece of technology, I'll, I'll use the transformer as an example. 
Uh, we could add all sorts of protection capability and sensing capability, but if the transformer cannot transform voltage, then it's not good at that number one priority, that number one application of that piece of technology. So it's very important to highlight the fact that we've got consistent and reliable functions um, and those core functions are met at the top of the list there. Then we can start looking at those other functions, um, you know, the sort of secondary functions, if you will, that come after that core function. The second one to mention is the open or compatibility. Um, you know, and from a software sense, you know, a lot of that uh, folks might think like open source or uh, intercommunicable. So you might have uh, multiple protection relays on a site um, and you might want to have the same type of relay all over your site so you have that compatibility. Um, and that does not necessarily mean that it's exclusive to, you know, single relay to single relay. You don't necessarily have to have the brand, but if you were designing something that said, uh, say it used DNP3 protocol to communicate, you might want to make sure that your other equipment is also compatible in that avenue um, to make sure, again, that, that use, use case is optimized and it's repeatable as possible. This third bullet here, this is really the, probably the most difficult one to quantify. I mean, this is really that standard but custom note that I was kind of referring to um, earlier. The, the idea that you can kind of have, a, I'll call it a kitchen full of ingredients, but you can make those different dishes as, as you see fit. But ultimately that kitchen is standardized. They have the, the standardized parts. They have a standard practice for creating that dish. Ultimately, we're, we're trying to create a recipe that is repeatable, but still scalable and can be personalized, can still be tailored to that application. Um, and that's that's where we really get into some of this, this new technology, especially with microprocessor-based relays, um, where you do have the ability to kind of keep the hardware very similar to one another, but you can tailor in those specific protection settings um, or activate certain um, certain different groups or say something like a maintenance mode in order to tailor it to a, a specific setting in that uh, in that specific application. And then the other two, um, somewhat obvious here, but the, the simple and intuitive nature of a product, obviously it's, it's very good if something's extremely high functioning, but if no one knows how to use it and uh, you don't understand how to, to interface with it, that doesn't necessarily make it a good product. So we want to make sure that as we create this multifunctioning sort of set of equipment and as we meet multiple application requirements with uh, whether it's a single control or, or a single piece of uh, MV equipment, like a single transformer, we want to make sure that it's, while it is compatible, it's easy to use and intuitive. And then of course, um, well supported, right? Um, you're going to need some of that engineering support, the technical knowledge. Uh, you wouldn't want to be handed this, uh, I guess, this, this bag of parts and, and be told that it's, it's up to you. You really do need some of that engineering support, whether that's coming from your manufacturer or if you're doing something like an analysis and in the case of easy power, you know, understanding how I can basically use something like a, you know, an arc flash related software to easily analyze my system and, and best make uh, that product then optimized and tailored for my application. So ultimately this, what does this mean for, you know, electrical distribution equipment in the MV and the LV world? Um, and this is really where I, I derive my smaller, safer, superior kind of commentary here. That the smaller is really looking to, you know, eliminate unnecessary redundancy and I'm, I'm not referring to you know a double-ended substation type of redundancy that that's more of an obvious backup uh, scenario but um, things like multiple current sensors or multiple voltage sensors um, when you're having overlapping zones of protection you want to make sure that that is as seamless and, and easily coordinated as possible and ultimately that's going to mean that the fewest number of components um, without sacrificing your redundancy to, to a certain degree but um, without overlapping or, or overdoing uh, those certain, you know, say protection zones as an example. Um, it also is going to mean least number of interconnections. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, ways to do protection systems, uh, obvious, um, you know, selections often are, are vacuum interrupters or, or vacuum breakers where you have this electronically trippable component. You might have some sensors and some relaying combined in that. Uh, but if I'm going to have to tie all that in separately on site, um, it doesn't, exactly make it not complex. You know, I might have a very sophisticated protection system, but the execution of that protection system is extremely difficult. And, and perhaps I put a lot of work into my standardization, my, my cut and paste, and made sure I can repeat that on different sites, but that doesn't necessarily negate the, the physicality of putting that together and really creating it as a, a full package, even testing it, going as far as to, you know, commission that equipment can be a whole nother hurdle that we have to think about as we're, we're talking about 
uh, protection systems and, and multifunctioning pieces of equipment. Um, safer is a little bit more of an obvious one. Obviously, that there's really two sides to that. That's uh, the low risk of hazard to the operator. Um, so I've mentioned arc flash a few times already. That's, that's again, kind of obvious that we want things to be as safe as possible to work around. Um, but then the other side to that is not just the operator, it's the safety for the piece of equipment as well. Um, you know, I have often uh, encountered customers where, you know, we are installing some means of protection and, and we're targeting, say, a, an eight calorie per squared uh, instant energy, something where, you know, the user can now be in that, that gloves and face shield. And in most cases, even if it is a, a level one uh, PPE category, they're probably still going to wear the gloves and face shield. You know, why, why wouldn't you add that extra layer of safety? Um, so I have those same customers now, they'll ask, you know, what, what is the value proposition to get from a, a level two where I'm wearing my gloves and face shield down to a level one? Why, why would I need to do that if my users are already fairly safe? And obviously more safety for the operator is better, but there's another piece to that puzzle and that's equipment safety. Um, you can imagine that you, you would have a, maybe a low voltage assembly. And if I had an arc flash incident in there that perhaps was relatively safe to the user, um, their arc flash distance was, uh, or their boundary rather, was enough where the user's in a pretty safe scenario, but my equipment damage is now still fairly high when I'm in that level two zone. And that's something I wanna make sure that, you know, from a, a standpoint of how do I get that equipment back online? What's the total capital cost? Um, downtime and outages is obviously another very big piece. So how can I increase safety, not only for my operator, but also for my equipment and ideally increase the longevity of that piece of equipment as well and, and keep my costs um, for fixing something like that as low as possible. And then superior is a, a, a tad hand wavy, but that's, that's the one we're all striving for. That's better performance, better price, better lead time. Um, winning on all factors, you know, and, and not always can you win on all of those. Obviously, you know, price and lead time are, you know, kind of go hand in hand, um, maybe negate performance in certain ways. You know, a, a less performing piece of equipment might be lower price, lower lead time uh, versus a higher functioning piece of equipment might negate the other two. But ideally, we're, we're really looking to, you know, achieve as much of all three of those as possible. So really thinking about this smaller, safer, superior and kind of driving home the fact that we really do want to I ideally hit all these notes, especially as we look into these, these multifunctioning pieces of equipment. So I kind of already drove this home on the, the last slide, but I've got my, my black box here. This is gonna be representative of our, our AR VFI transformer in, in a few slides here, but really what, is, what does this do now that we say we did achieve it? We, we're smaller, we're safer, we're superior. What does that gain me in terms of my equipment? Is it worth it? Um, what's the real draw for me as, as the customer, as the owner, the contractor to do something like this? And, and what this really means is with these safer pieces of equipment, you can bring these connections, these higher voltage connections closer into the building or, or even all the way indoors. You can reduce those number of inter interconnections. You can essentially make a, a more smart integrated system um, that has le it's less prone to failure, less maintenance points and things like that. And I'll, I'll basically... I'll go back to the, the printed circuit board analogy here for just a moment. If we're looking at a, a printed circuit board and you've got, you know, in the, in the days of the cell phone, you had, uh, you had your cell phone in your pocket, you had your camera in your pocket, you had maybe a calculator in your pocket. Not everybody's carrying that around their pocket, but you get the point. You know, I have multiple batteries to carry around. I have multiple buttons to manage. You know, there's a lot of different pieces of that that could fail, that could need maintenance, that might need new power supplies. Um, as we integrate this equipment and we go to singular controls, you know, the singular new modern phone or a singular piece of MB equipment, we can eliminate some of that unnecessary redundancy. And, and when I say unnecessary, again, this is not necessarily the, the backup transformer. This would be, I don't want a bunch of different switches doing the same thing. That's going to be too many components doing the, this, achieving the same function. So if I can eliminate you know, mechanical components, things like that, that are going to potentially add risk or, or add maintenance requirements to my system, that's gonna be an overall benefit. And then of course, the nice benefit that's, that's sort of obvious is we're eliminating some of those unnecessary components is we're gonna get a, an overall smaller system. Um, hopefully that's gonna reduce the cost, that's gonna reduce the overall layout complexity, um, and ultimately the installation complexity. I, I mentioned the you know, interconnecting, say an MB switch and current transformers, relaying, you know, doing that all on site. If we can find a way to, you know, consolidate that package into a, more of a single piece of equipment, 
that's going to allow us to reduce that headache on site and ultimately make the uh, the uptime uh, or rather the install time greatly reduced and greatly less, uh, much less complex. So just a, a few examples. Um, these are some some eaten products, but you can find very similar stuff uh, throughout the industry here. Um, a medium voltage in the control assembly world or the motor control center world. Um, you're obviously going to have your arc resistant MV switch gear. Um, you're going to have remote racking, thermal monitoring. Um, in the LVA world, low voltage assemblies, uh, we're now seeing, in addition to the arc resistant, something arc quenching, you know, where you're actually uh, essentially creating bolted faults to, to quench that, to remove that fault from the scenario. Um, they're doing the same, very similar stuff as MV, you know, those remote racking, um, the thermal monitoring as well. Um, but you do also do see some, you know, remote dashboards and things like that for interfacing with your products. And then on the transformer side, and what we're going to focus on um, for the remainder of the presentation here, uh, we're really looking at some of this integrated equipment, these integrated uh, vacuum interrupters. So I have the VFI, they're the vacuum fault interrupter. Um, so integrating that into the transformer, um, integrating that overcurrent sensing, uh, integrating that relaying, and also doing a similar remote racking or remote switching in those cases. And and what we can do with that technology and how we, how that technology being implemented in, in a transformer or in a substation lineup or, or whatever your MV gear is, how can that truly benefit you from an arc flash perspective? So we're gonna jump in just real quick on some of the current codes and standards. I say current, these are the sort of the latest and greatest, although um, you know a little bit old now back in 2015 in terms of OSHA, uh, the newer one, uh, 1584 coming up here in just a moment I'll talk about. But essentially just putting these out here as a reminder, um, you know, in terms of MV equipment or arc flash zones, typically uh, the, the rule really is, you know, if you've got some piece of equipment, whether it's a transformer secondary or it is a piece of low voltage equipment, if you've got 40 calories per centimeter squared or greater in that equipment, it must be de-energized. You're not permitted to work on that for OSHA. Um, and, and to be quite honest, you wouldn't want to work on that. It's, it's extremely dangerous. and uh, while there is PP out there that you know can go to 40, even up to 100, that's that's really you know more for that fire uh, repelling, that fire resistant nature, rather than the arc blast, the physical concussive force that we see from you know some of these arc flash events. So you know a much better way to do this, rather than just downing PPE or or staying away or, or being you know remote from the uh, the event, is how do we actually mitigate that energy altogether? How do we reduce that and make it truly a safer piece of equipment? The other piece I wanted to highlight in terms of codes and standards would be IEEE 1584 for the arc flash hazard calculations. Um, many of you might be familiar with this standard, especially if you're, uh, you're familiar with using Easy Power or, or doing arc flash studies. Um, recently, in about 2018, I believe it was around November, uh, they released a IEEE released an updated version of the standard. Um, the previous version, uh, 2002, technically 2011, which was some semantic updates, but really the 2002. Uh, standard or, or guide there only based on about 300 different arc flash tests and it was really centered around uh, I'll call it one electrode configuration and, and one enclosure size and those are the two I really want to highlight here that are the biggest differences there's a few other nuances um, in the changing a little bit of again more semantics but the biggest two that we're looking at um, in these new findings is they did these additional 2,000 tests on these different ranges of voltages and and um, these electro configurations, what we found was uh, that essentially the enclosure size, the physical size at which the three-phase bus work sits in, um, that makes a huge difference. So you can imagine if I had, uh, I'll use the transformer as an example here, the transformer secondary on say a pad mount transformer, you know, I've got those low voltage spades uh, right in that cabinet. Cabinets uh, you know, can range in size, usually uh, big enough for a person to kind of get squeeze in one of those, uh, you might see a very large, uh, say a 7,500 KVA pad um, that is, is fairly big and it's got a pretty big enclosure. So the, the way the arc is gonna propagate inside of that enclosure is vastly different. Um, you can kind of think of it like, uh, to some degree, almost like uh, the barrel of a gun, if you were to you know, kind of squeeze that pressure uh, and project that out of the user, or if you had a much more open cavity uh, for that pressure to, to kind of extinguish itself. And then the second one there is electro configuration. And what that means in terms of IEEE is really the layout of your three-phase bus work. How does that bus work uh, move through that piece of equipment? Uh, in the transformer scenario, that bus work is really those, those spades, those terminals that are coming out of the secondary. 
yeah, that is our, our electrode configuration uh, versus maybe a piece of low voltage gear. You imagine take the rear panels off and you might see horizontal bus and some vertical bus and some goes in and some comes out of the gear, um, all sorts of different kind of layouts. And depending on where that arc happens, it's gonna propagate differently and you're gonna get different result and instant energy values. Very important to highlight those two pieces as, as we kind of analyze um, these different setups and try to make the right choice for the product. Um, looking at those uh, those electro configurations in a little bit more detail, I, I do have these listed out in their associated acronyms. Um, you can imagine, you know, all these different kind of bus works are the uh, representative of the three phase bus work moving through those different pieces of the gear. Um, so you might imagine that a sort of figure two here, these electrodes coming down and kind of hitting the top of something that might be representative of, say, a multi case breaker, where you've got the three phase leads coming in and it's hitting the top of the breaker. Uh, if you have horizontal or vertical electrodes in open air, this might be more like a utility substation where you've got bushings that are cover mounted on the transformer and the arc has a lot of room to propagate. It's not directed necessarily right at the user, um, but the most dangerous and, and what we see the most incident energy in is really the center one, figure three, the horizontal electrodes in a box. Um, and you can see that the, the graphic here is kind of showing the, the arc itself kind of shooting out, out of the page here outwards towards the user. And this is very similar to what we would see on a three-phase pad-mounted transformer or perhaps a substation with terminal chambers on the sides where those three-phase bushings are exiting horizontally out of the transformer and you've got an enclosure where the only open side of that enclosure is really between the bushings and the user. And, and that's gonna make that arc propagate towards them and, and that can be extremely dangerous. So what we've seen in terms of changes uh, from the 2002 to the 2018 edition is in some cases it was a it was a pretty good representation if you were over here on figure one 2002 gave you a pretty good idea it's a pretty good middle of the road um, if you act, actually were somewhere in the open air scenario perhaps 2002 was a little more stringent than you needed to be this is less bad comparatively to to what we had assumed but in other cases like this horizontal electrodes in a box it, it can be far worse we can get to nearly 190% the value that we would have calculated with our 2002 edition. So you can imagine if I calculated in 2002 that I had say 22 calories per centimeter squared, I was, I was somewhere in this level three, yes, I had my moon suit on, but I, I felt I was relatively protected. In reality, if I was working on a, a transformer secondary, and I had that HCB, that horizontal electrodes in a box, I might be about 190% of that you know, at the, the greatest degree. And I actually might have been over the 40 calorie limit. So in terms of what OSHA uh, dictates and, and this cutoff of 40 calorie, that, that still exists. All the, the tests were done with those actual energy values, but what's changed is our understanding of how that arc propagates and what the resultant calorie level is. And as we see, you know, the change in complexity of 1584, the addition of all these different variables, we, we went from about I believe about three, three or six variables on the 2002 to, to well over 18 and plus iterations on the 2018 version. So you can imagine it is, it's much harder now to take into account all of these variables and determine if I'm doing the, the correct thing, if I'm calculating my arc flash in the right way. And, and that's something that's where Easy Power can come in and help you guys out is it, really, you know, using a, a powerful tool rather than, you know, the back of the napkin calculation on what this can do for me. Um, or what arc flash levels I have, you know, I can use something that's going to factor in 1584's updated requirements. It's going to factor in those enclosure sizes and the electro configurations. And it's going to be able to to really give you a more concrete answer on what you're dealing with, uh, regardless of whether you're talking, you know, integrated equipment that we're featuring here, or or just more of a traditional lineup. No matter what you do. So just to you know, highlight some of those kind of standard uh, features and standard zones, if you're looking at a kind of a normal pad mount transformer, you've got things that are inside of the dark flash hazard zone. You've got name plates, you've got gauges, you've got drain valves, uh, in some cases bayonet fuses on the primary, uh, low brake switches, sectionalizing switches. You know, all of this is very close to the arc flash hazard zone. Um, and with the way the standards are currently written on these, you got to open this low voltage compartment first before even being able to get to high voltage. Um, and you may think high voltage is, you know, it's more dangerous, there's more energy there. To a certain degree that is correct, but with the dead front primaries that are very common on transformers, we see that as a much lower arc risk zone. 
versus the amount of energy that's present here in these live front connections. This can very quickly turn to be a catastrophic event uh, if you don't have some some level of a very quick protection. You know, you might have a very small transformer, and for that reason, you might have a lower energy. But if uh, you recall back to our, our poll question at the beginning, you might have a 2,500 kVA transformer, and you've got a boatload of energy here, um, well over what's going to be that 40 calorie limit. So, you know, how do we how do we make that safer? Um, how do we understand what that energy is and, and correctly and analyze it? But then also, what can we do about it, and, and how can we make that even more more safe for the user? So what I want to touch on now is, is just a few system study examples. So I've got two uh, actual system studies that were done. So no actual arc flash events in those two, uh, just kind of the before and after. We'll go through, a, I'll call it a with and without some of this uh, secondary protection on the transformer. And then I do have a, a fully integrated um, AR VFI transformer that we did uh, un unfortunately happen to have an actual arc flash event on some low voltage gear. But what is fortunate about that is that uh, we did have the system in place and we were able to mitigate that arc energy. And I'll show the results of, of uh, that, that event as well. So just looking at our, our first case study here, um, this was a bottling plant expansion. So it was kind of a heavy, uh, heavy commercial uh, facility here where you know, they're producing quite a bit of bottles of, of in this case, it was, uh, it was a well-branded uh, liquor in this case, which uh, you know, keeps plenty of people happy. Uh, but we've got the, uh, in this case, they had some of their mission critical requirements would be uh, not able to accommodate in you know, arc resistant switch gear. They did want to have this robust nature of, of the equipment. Um, they had some level of, you know, sensing capability. They were okay with adding in sensing and relaying. But probably the biggest one that, that came out of this is that they needed something that acted in an always on fashion. And I'll, I'll describe what that means in more detail. But really, you know, when you have certain, certain relaying or certain protection. Um, you might be familiar with things like maintenance mode or hotline tag out there. There are ways you can manu manually intervene and you can tweak settings while you're working on equipment and, and that can make it quite a bit safer. Uh, however, you know, that does require human intervention. That requires someone to go and activate that or, or a switch or a signal to, to go into that piece of equipment and turn that on. Um, and that, that's effective, but you know, what would be even better is something that is always protecting, that's constantly looking and, and constantly being able to react with a certain level of speed that's gonna keep that arc energy low. So looking at our case study here, uh, just kind of a single line diagram. Um, in this case, we've got pole mounted reclosers that are feeding the transformers. We've got our standard pad mount transformers with our secondary CTs, and those are critical to the discussion here. And then below that, we've got our 5051 relaying feeding our, our low voltage gear, our, our draw out switch gear. That's going to be the zone that we're analyzing right now in this case. So this, this next slide is, is just moving down on the single line. So what I just showed was just above here, um, just feeding this. So this is our, our draw out switch gear here that we're going to analyze. And what we're looking at right now is between that draw out switch gear, so ahead of that main breaker, and all the way upstream to the, the next most protected device. So go back again, that's this pole mounted vacuum recloser right here. So if we go all the way up the line, there's no other protected devices um, that can be triple tripped in any way besides this recloser and then ultimately the fuse ahead of that. So what we're gonna look at first is, you know, what if we're just relying on that vacuum recloser? What if it's just that primary protection? And again, this is similar to that poll question. What if I have primary protection alone? I'm not I don't have those secondary CTs. I don't have this 5051 relay. I'm just relying on that vacuum recloser to interrupt whatever uh, fault current, arc flash current I have ahead of my low voltage main in this in this hazard zone. I'm kind of noted down here in my between the transformer and, and LB main. So without that 5051 relay, again, just the upstream recloser, we're looking at about 160 calories uh, per centimeter squared in that arc flash hazard zone. So that's, that's a very high arc flash energy. If you remember, I just mentioned the 40 calorie limit. So that's four times over what would be uh, really accessible with any PPE per OSHA. So that's, and, and really that's even 60 calories above any PPE that even exists. Uh, you know, I mean, this is extremely high energy. This is a scenario where you must de-energize in order to work on this equipment. And, and that was a, a requirement for this customer is that they, they really needed to be able to, to do hot work. They needed to keep their lines up and they needed to make sure that this, had that always on protection that I was referring to, not something where um, somebody needed to engage a, a second maintenance mode or something like that. They wanted some way to um, have this active at all times. That's really gonna be that, that secondary relaying and secondary set of CT. So rather simple way to do this. 
you know, adding in those secondary CTs on the transformer and having those feed that 5051 relay on the secondary and then have that relay trip that vacuum recloser rather than relying on the vacuum recloser itself and, and its coordination. And, and remember, before I show our arc flash values here, you know, why is that vacuum recloser, why is it less fast? Well, you know, why is the secondary set of CTs worse than the primary set of CTs? And, and the real answer on that is that those primary CTs, the primary um, always on settings have to be coordinated for that transformer inrush. And they're gonna have a little bit of lag between uh, you know, pulling current on the secondary, reflecting through the transformer and, and pulling on the primary. That, that's not completely negligible, but it is, it's fairly quick. Uh, but the real lag is coming from the fact that this, uh, this primary recloser has to be set very far out, very loosely um, in order to overcome that transformer inrush. And because it's set loosely like that, it's gonna react a heck of a lot slower and that's gonna result in that higher energy. So as we add in those secondary CTs, we don't have to rely on that inrush. Uh, we don't have to coordinate with that inrush. We don't have any inrush because we're downstream of that core coil. So we can set the, the protection settings on the 5051 much, much tighter than we could if we were doing something with a, a primary set of CTs or a primary device. So signaling that vacuum recloser with this 5051 rather than allowing it to wait on its own, um, we're gonna see a, a huge reduction in the overall uh, arc flash energy down now below um, the, the acceptable level, of, or rather the, the permissible level of 40 cals, um, even below the 20 cal limit. And again, this is an always on scenario. Um, we could even further reduce this uh, by activating a maintenance mode on the, uh, the 5051 relay. Um, and this is also not sacrificing coordination you know, by having this. So that's another really big piece is obviously we want our feeder breakers to go off before our main breakers and our main to go off before our vacuum recloser. So we're coordinating those all together and trying to make them trip in that certain cadence. Um, so we're able to do that without sacrificing our, our main breaker coordination. I mean, we're still able to get down to that, that lower, much lower energy than we were before, um, eight and a half times lower than that 160 calories limit with this 5051 relay. So another uh, case study here that I wanna show is uh, basically this, um, or excuse me, this is the, the TCC for the, the previous design that we just had, just kind of showing you, as I was referring to, the, the coordination, really this SNC fuse being, this is what's feeding that uh, just ahead of the, or upstream rather, of the recloser, the recloser curve itself, and then where we can be with the secondary relay. And now transformer inrush down here, the small blue dot, um, typically we're, we're gonna have that recloser relay set, you know, to get around that inrush value, so we're not nuisance tripping on startup, uh, but it's going to, you know, create that longer duration as opposed to something like an instantaneous or, or 51 setting on the secondary relay that can react quite a bit faster. So our second case study is, is a little bit more integrated. So you can tell I'm, I'm going to start blending these products or these, these uh, components rather into a kind of a single piece of equipment as we get into our, our final uh, case study, our final event. So in this case, this was a, a defense company, a large U.S. defense company, and they had similar requirements. They needed that uptime. Uh, this was for wastewater treatment, the specific branch of their uh, of their system. And they wanted to make sure that, again, this was a, an always-on protection, something that uh, they, they really could not set, could not uh, afford to have any nuisance trips or nuisance operations or, or have any shutdowns, really manual or initiated shutdowns, in order to, uh, to create a safer scenario. So they wanted this in a very similar sense, this always-on protection. So again, kind of looking at their single line. In this case, you had the pull-mounted fuse cutouts. This is the utility portion right here. Um, and then feeding, uh, now are slightly more integrated than last time. We've got our pad mount transformer with secondary CTs like we did in case study one. But in that pad mount transformer, we also have a vacuum interrupter. We have a trippable device. So instead of an upstream recloser that we're tripping, we've now got a, a consolidated piece of equipment here that's transformer, vacuum interrupter, as well as those secondary CTs. Uh, however, in this case, we do have the relaying portion still in the downstream gear. So you know, I talked about on-site commissioning. There's still a little bit to tie here. This is not a fully integrated package, but this is something where it is getting a little bit closer and, and kind of consolidating those components, allowing the factory to functionally verify this whole component rather than a separate recloser, separate transformer, separate relay. We're getting a little bit more integrated here. And then the, the rest of the feeder bus, which is uh, somewhat ancillary in this discussion. So again, kind of looking at the, the same similar breakdown. Uh, so this is more of a single line fashion of what I, I just had up on screen. We've got the 
uh, fuses upstream, so the pole mount fuse cutouts. Uh, the actual VFI here is listed as this 12 kVA, excuse me, 12 kA breaker. Then feeding that transformer along with our secondary CTs. So we'll take a look at this just like we did on the other one. We're going to say, let's assume that there is no secondary CTs, assume there is no VFI. If I was going to wait for that pole mounted fuse to go off in order to protect my zone, again, my zone being you know, real big hazard zone between anywhere pretty much between that pull mount fuse and my, my LV main. I'm going to result in a, a 30 point, excuse me, 33.9 calorie per centimeter squared arc flash energy. And now this is, you know, you might say this is below 40. This is accessible. Um, this is a customer that had a, a strong preference for the gloves and face shield. You can imagine I, I had that um, graphic up that was showing the different levels of PPE. You know, that moon suit, uh, that, that, level three or level four moon suit, it, it does, you know, have some means of protection, the fire resistance, but you can imagine you're much more prone to making errors in something like that as well. I, it, you're going to have, you know, on board, you're going to have something like these big gloves and, and all these other instances that are going to make it pretty difficult for you to, to do your job and maybe more prone to make errors. So this, this customer really desired having the, the lower uh, range of that below the level two, below that eight calorie level. So we'll look at that again, now utilizing those secondary CTs to trip that VFI. So since that secondary overcurrent, again, our, our secondary relaying does not have to be coordinated for inrush. That's going to trip it quite a bit faster. That's going to get us down below that eight level. And again, this isn't always on. This is not a maintenance mode. Uh, this isn't something that's, you know, upgraded in any way manually. This is something that's always going to give you uh, that level of arc flash protection. So now we'll move on to our, our real world, our flash event. This is you know, a little bit more exciting for us who don't get to uh, see that, that, that often. So we've now got a, a full uh, integrated piece of equipment. So this is just an example of a VFI transformer. So again, integral vacuum interrupter inside of the transformer. Uh, but the big piece here is now, in addition to that secondary set of CTs, we're also having that onboard relay. We also have the local relay. Uh, in this case, it was an SEL device to pick up that secondary overcurrent and trip the VFI. And the huge benefit from a commissioning perspective is this is all functionally verified at the factory. There isn't any you know, tie my relay to my breaker or, or tie my CTs back to the relay or you know what size or components do I have? Um, any of that kind of questions that can come up when you're designing or trying to implement um, or commission or test a, a protection system, those can all be you know, handled by, by an integrator or a manufacturer. So in this case, we had our 12470 to 480Y, 4 MVA transformer with a, a 6,000 amp bus coming off the secondary. So lots of energy present there that's capable of coming out of this transformer. Uh, but we do have that, that integrated uh, system that I was referring to. Um, and just for kind of a reference point here, uh, we did have this particular customer that had this event. Um, this, this happened four different times uh, during commissioning events. And you might think you know, that you know, I, I was referring to um, the primary side settings having to be coordinated for transformer inrush. And, yeah, that's only, you know, that's only relative when I'm starting up the transformer, but startup and commissioning is one of the most risky times for incidents. You know, that's when things are being tested initially. Things may not be fully tested or, or maybe there, there is errors. You know, that is one of the very risky times. Uh, there might be, um, as we're going to see in these next images, might still be things like shipping supports that are in the way that, are, that could cause a fault instance. Um, so very important to, you know, not use things like you know, uh, basically inrush blocking or something like that, where I'm just not, I'm just not looking at any fault conditions during the startup. I'm going to ride through inrush and then I'll activate my protection settings. Well, if we do that, you, you might ride right through uh, what is an actual fault. So it's, it's this always on fashion is a much more, um, you know, concise and, and clean way to, to do this protection. So just kind of taking a look at that fault event itself. Um, you've got that fault event just starting right about here. You can see that uh, the, uh, a and B phases, so our A in red and our B in yellow kind of take the brunt of it. C is kind of trailing on behind. We get to our fault magnitude, our kind of peak magnitude, about a cycle through that, and then about another cycle or so, just a little bit over, we're actually fully cleared. Uh, so this is the, the sensing, the, the pickup by the CTs, uh, the commutation of that fault to the relay, and the sensing uh, sending of the trip signal. And when you see that orange line, that's the issuance of the trip signal to uh, the, the internal vacuum interrupter, and then the interrupters open in clear time there. And, and in this case, extremely fast overall clearing time. The device that we were using, the vacuum interrupter itself, uh, one of the fastest on the market, but that's a, that's a two-cycle device. So we've got all the sensing and relaying down to about a quarter second there, excuse me, about a quarter cycle there, which is extremely fast. Um, and that's going to result 
in an energy of about 1.9 calories per centimeter squared. Um, I will, uh, you know, divulge that in this instance, there, there was a maintenance mode activated. Um, so this, this was a case where they, you know, they were doing the startup and they did have that extra level of protection. Uh, but even still, had you not have maintenance mode, uh, the calculations would show that this is still only about uh, four point, um, well, it's about 4.8 calories in that case. So still extremely low because of this integrated secondary sensing. And, and really the other benefits of that integrated package, the signal proximity, the, the optimization of the components, you know, you're not, you're not having these high burden CTs that are trying to relay a signal over a, a vast distance. You've got that small integrated package that's gonna allow you to do the, the quickest um, reaction that you could possibly do with that, that technology. So really taking proven technology and you know, things that have been around for years, schemes that have been around for years and understanding how we can optimize that and how we can make a, a reliable you know, kind of copy and paste design that can really work for a variety of applications. And, and as I started this discussion, be tailored to your specific application. So just showing uh, some of the, the actual fault pictures here, we're looking inside of the low voltage gear um, and it's a little bit hard to see, but right behind these two pieces of bus, this is the A and B bus here. There's actually a piece of shipping support, um, this plate that you're seeing on the right-hand side that had fallen and slid down behind that. Normally, it's kind of taken out of the roof of this gear and it slid down behind there. And of course, nobody noticed it in this case. And again, they're going through commissioning. And of course, upon startup, you're going to get that parking fault um, that would short across here. And remember, this is a 6,000 amp piece of bus work. Normally, if this was an unprotected secondary, we didn't have that relaying, we would have vaporized this gear. This would have been this would have been completely need to be completely torn out and reinstalled and you know that project schedule there bye bye project schedule because you know now we're having to reorder gear you're up against lead time walls all the cost um, implications that come out of that uh, versus something that could essentially be removed from the gear cleaned up a little bit and you're ready to go you're back online um, you know unfortunately you know no one's hurt and as I indicated before. Not only is no one hurt, but your gear's not hurt. You know, that, that's the second piece of, we all care about the human health, but it's really nice when the gear uh, isn't suffering that as well. So just kind of, uh, you know, highlighting and what I really want to highlight here is the, the TCC on this. And uh, I kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but that transformer inrush curve, that black line, uh, for comparing a, just a primary side breaker setting. So the same exact breaker, still that two cycle VFI breaker, but it's about as tight as you can get without crossing that inrush threshold. I don't want a nuisance operator on, on startup, but I want to be as protected as I can. If I'm looking at that orange line, I'm about 144 cycles, 125 calories if I have my primary, primary device alone. Again, well over where that, that uh, you know, 40 calorie cutoff is going to be. And then as we look at our, our instantaneous line again in the, the 50 setting here that we had, um, we're extremely, extremely low relative in comparison. So we're about 2.22 cycles and about 1.9 calories per centimeter squared. And, and I mentioned before, you know, if we had that 50-51 setting, you, know, you use something like a, an anti-extreme inverse curve. You can imagine this would curve in a little bit more like that. And instead of, say, you know, this 2.22 cycles, we'd be a little bit higher on that just because of that, the time delay on, on a curve like that. But we're still going to be, you know, in the, the very, very... Um, short range, we're going to be under that eight calorie per centimeter square. It's still within that level two and that gloves and face shield just by having that secondary set of CTs and, and that extra relaying that's going to make this go go a huge long way in terms of in terms of uh, protection on that transform. So just just to give a, you know one last highlight, um, I know we're getting a little bit short on time and, and I do want to have uh, just a, a few minutes for question and answer. So the bulk of what I want to get across to you today is that really those, those primary devices alone if you're relying on just that primary fuse or that primary vacuum interrupter, you know, that's that's going to really create this hazard zone between the low voltage of the transformer and the low excuse me, the low voltage main breaker. Now that that is a, a zone that yes, you will eventually interrupt if there's no arc flash concern, the fuse will operate. It's not going to not operate, you know, in some cases it can take uh, you know several seconds for that to fully operate, uh, but if you want to improve that system, if you want to make this into a reduced zone, that's really where something like the ARVFI transformer, or even a, in a more traditional sense, you know, a vacuum interrupter with that secondary relaying. I, I show here differential relaying, just so we're covering our primary, covering our secondary, perhaps some differential in, in the inner zone, um, but everything downstream of that secondary set of CTs is much, much safer. And we've now taken, you know, what was the, essentially the zone between transformer secondary and the sensing of the main breaker, that very large hazard zone. 
we've shrunk that hazard zone now between transformer secondary and set of CTs. This is all in tank. Um, and now it's eliminated as a arc flash hazard altogether because it's completely out of the way of the user. It's a sealed in tank environment. So we can do a, a lot of, uh, of really simple protection um, by just adding some of these components and understanding schemes that have been around for, for years now, um, but really taking those, those components and leveraging that really safety by design and, and creating a, a more safe product overall. Um, so there's a, there's a few other you know, slides in here about componentry, um, some analyses that, that you guys can look over. Um, as Jim, Jim indicated, uh, we'll be sending out a, a copy of this presentation so you can take a look at this. And if you guys have any questions uh, to follow up on, feel free to contact me um, or Jim for that matter uh, via Easy Power, absolutely. Um, otherwise, uh, Jim, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll take those now. Um, and, and thank you guys for, for listening. It's a pleasure to, to talk about this stuff. Yeah, there are a couple questions, Sam. Uh, actually, one of them it seemed like you it was answered in line with the uh, slides you were doing, and uh, it was basically does the transformer primary fuse protection would that be faster than the recloser? And mm -hmm. you showed you showed that it would not. Is that the case in every installation, or is that something pretty much standard as far as the lineup or uh, sizing of the fuse? Yeah, it, it there's definitely has to be uh, you know taken into account the size of the fuse or, or the recloser settings. You know, reclosers can have things like the hotline tagger, which is you know their equivalent of maintenance mode. So there there's a little bit more um, I'll call it um, tightness you can achieve with the recloser, uh, but you're also at the whim of the recloser speed, the mechanical speed of that, which you know can negate in a little bit. Um, you know, we do see things like uh, current limiting fuses, extremely fast devices. You know, that's, that's hard to argue when you've got a current limiter that can, you know, clear a fault in less than half a cycle. But keep in mind that that current limiter still has to, again, be coordinated on the primary side and is going to be, you know, not quite as tightly set as you could have with a, a secondary um, sensing setup. So, you know, this was just to, just to help answer that question. This was a, a case study that was done on a 1500 KVA with 480 secondary and just, you know, the fastest we could possibly achieve, and this is assuming it's immediately a three-phase bolted fault. Obviously, if you've got single-phase to ground faults, um, it might take much, much longer for a bayonet uh, or you know a small fuse to react in that in that case because you've got, say, a delta Y transformer. Not only do you have that uh, the basically the division of the ratio of the transformer that's going to you know lower that fault current on the primary, but you're also uh, dividing again by square root of three because of that delta you're splitting up that load so that depending on your system depending on the fuse coordination or the recloser coordination um, one can be slightly faster or slower than the other um, but i would say that reclosers have the ability to be um, tailored or, or adjusted you know while while on load rather than you know a fuse is really it is what it is at the end of the day so you know you can't um, tighten a fuse after that coordination is set and that, that's that's definitely a, a restriction so a couple of the questions, I think you just answered another one, and that's related to the ground uh, fault response. There was a question, though, is how does this affect uh, a resistance grounded neutral uh, transformer? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very good question. And, and uh, you know, high resistance grounds or resistance grounds off, often used to mitigate some of that arc fault energy or rather the ground fault energy that's that's coming back through. And you know the integration of this, um, those 5051 relays often have a neutral CT input as well. Um, so I would suggest you know if you do have a, an NGR or something like that, that you incorporate that neutral CT so you can sense that directly. Um, there are of course residual ground fault settings you can look for like an imbalance, um, things like that. But but really um, you know if you're able to sense that even if it is a lower magnitude, that's where the the beauty of these microprocessor relays come in is you you can lower and tailor that. Um, to that specific design. And that's another thing that, that, you know, it's helpful when an integrator or an engineering firm or a manufacturer like Eaton in this case would, would get involved. We can help size those components to make sure that that works properly. So in a NGR system or, or a system with an NGR rather, you know, you might want a, a lower ratio um, neutral CT in that case, because you're going to want to pick that up more sensitively uh, versus, a, you know, solidly grounded where you're going to see the full brunt of fall current. Sure. Um, so that is something that is important, but um, absolutely can be tailored with, with this type of protection, most definitely. Lionel uh, is restating and wants to clarify, make sure that he's got it right. And that is basically 
what has been done in introducing a vacuum interrupter inside the tank and triggered by the relay so the fault clearing is taken away from the upstream fuse. Is that accurate? It, essentially, yes. Yeah, so in that... That could be, you know, the, the key here is that you've got an elect, something that's electronically trippable on the primary, something that, you know, it, it is, you can send that trip signal to, and instead of having to have, you know, wait for that fuse, um, you have this electronically trippable interrupter that can react much faster. So it's the relay and the CTs on the secondary are what's doing the reaction and, and then sending that signal. But the fact that you have that electronically trippable VFI, that, that's what's going to give you that ultimate speed there. Um, and, and really, you know, say you had your pull mount fuse cut out because those secondary settings are so much tighter, um, it is going to be coordinated first. You know, that, that's something you could have easily trip offline well before you would have to wait for that primary fuse. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's your own primary fuse or utility fuse feeding, feeding the transformer, you don't want to bother you, the utility. You'd rather you know, trip your own feeder offline. Um, that's really some of the intent behind that as well. And then one last question. And it was more of a definition. You mentioned a sustained electric arc. How does how, how do we get that as far as a simulation method? Sure, sure. So the the, the biggest difference here when I, when I say a sustained arc would be you know assuming that we're looking at a, a three phase bolted fault and something that is um, that's that's not a, quite as dynamic as a true fault. And this this is part of the this is part of the difficulty and, and what IEEE fifteen eighty four was trying to overcome. Um, and I think there's there's probably work to be done on that in terms of the true dynamic nature of, of faults, but really looking at the, that enclosure size and electro configuration and how that factors into the calculations, that's going to try to account for some of that dynamic nature, and it's going to treat it more like a real fault rather than, you know, making assumptions on the fact that it, you know, say a fault from A to B phase, you know, in reality, that's probably going to start A to B and propagate to A to B to C until, you know, it's, all over the place until it gets cleared. Um, so some of the enclosure size and electro configuration uh, values that you're using in 1584, that's gonna help dictate and help kind of um, smooth out that, that variability. I think that kind of covered most of the questions we got. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was a good amount of information, a lot to take in at one time. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, thank you guys for having me and, and really do appreciate the time. And um, if there's any follow up questions, you, you know where to find me. We'll do that. Thank you, Sam. Yep. Thank you.